Hello, everyone. As Kat said, uh, my name is Mary. I'm a Greens MP in New South Wales Parliament and also the portfolio holder for drugs and harm minimization for the Greens. And I would like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we gathered on, the Banjalung people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. As you all know, this land always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you all for coming today, and it is an absolute pleasure for me to be back here in Nimbin at this time of Mardi Gras. Um, and I've called this session today Cannabis Legalization, not a question of if, but when. Because I really have a profound sense of optimism at the moment about how far this movement has come and how we are getting closer and closer. It's still taking its time, but we are actually getting closer and closer to our aim of legalizing adult recreational cannabis use in this country. Um, and I do think that it is, like I said, it's a question of not if, but when, but that when will depend on how we choose to grow this movement to make it even bigger. Um, and I know that it may not seem like it when you look at the Labour and the Liberal parties, but it is. Historically, you see, it is always the politicians who are the last to fall into line. Um, just this week, I, I was at a talk from Bill McKibben, the founder of a climate change organization, 350.org. And one thing that he said has really stayed with me. Um, and he said that the real battle for us, no matter what sort of ch positive change we want to bring, it is changing the zeitgeist. And what he meant w w by that was that it's a real challenge to change the mood of the nation, changing those casual conversations and, you know, what is considered common sense. And when, once we have reached that tipping point, what politicians once said was impossible, I think becomes inevitable. Take marriage equality or take medical cannabis. These are just two examples. These issues were spoken about for a long time, but it's only in the last few years that we've seen them come out of the shadows and actually become a reality. So I'd like to thank the community here, actually, for all the massive amount of work that you've done over decades, really, and also being key part of changing that zeitgeist. So I think it is really well, to, uh, well worth also reflecting on how far we have come around the world and in Australia. I mean, we know incredibly one in five Americans actually now lives in a state where adult use of cannabis is legal, or it is in the process of becoming legal. Canada is on track to join Uruguay in legalizing cannabis for adult use for all its citizens. And all of this does matter to us in Australia because our drug policies have always had an international focus. We have a war on drugs in Australia in part because we have been historically influenced by what happens elsewhere. There has, of course, been an active and vibrant movement here in Australia in New South Wales, and of course where we are um, today in Nimbin. Slowly but surely, the debate and the way that it's being framed is changing, and it continues to change every single day. So in 2015, the New South Wales Greens became the first Greens branch in Australia to adopt a policy for legalizing and regulating cannabis. And I must say, I'm very proud of the part that I played in it. Like I said, I am the spokesperson for drugs and harm minimization, and we worked really hard with the New South Wales Greens Drugs and Policy Working Group and pushed through this policy. And I'm, I was really surprised at how much support it had, of course, in the Greens, but also in the broader community as well. And you may have seen just a few weeks ago, I stood with the Australian Greens leader, Senator Richard Di Natale, the former Australian Federal Police Commissioner, Mick Palmer, and Dr. Alice Wardak to launch the Australian Greens policy to legalize and regulate cannabis. This policy is a position that many of us in the party have been working very hard for. So it is really exciting to see that, you know, we've actually done it at a federal level now. Uh, the policy would essentially regulate and tax commercial cannabis. In place of prohibition, we would create a regulated cannabis market and establish an Australian cannabis agency. And this agency would effectively be the center of how um, things work around licenses, uh, for cannabis production and sale, and it would act as a single wholesaler between the producer and the retailer. And we want to make sure that there are much more licenses 
for smaller scale producers because we have learned our lessons from other places um, around the world. The agency would also carry out a program for monitoring and enforcement of premises which produce and sell cannabis and conduct ongoing reviews and also monitor the scheme to make sure that it is an optimally functioning scheme. We would also license, or this agency would also license stores to sell cannabis and importantly, protect the ability of people to grow and consume their own cannabis. So the policy at the moment has six plants which people could grow um, on their own. Um, and of course, one thing um, I want to emphasize is that one thing we are really conscious of is not repeating the mistakes that have been made with big alcohol and big tobacco and create big cannabis. Yeah, I think that's really important. And that's why this agency will be the one point of um, wholesale, buying directly from growers and selling to retailers and making sure that the licensing is much heavily focused on the small producer as well. But sadly and predictably, I have to say, the reaction to our policy from both Labour Party and Liberal Party was the same tired old rhetoric. They said cannabis, cannabis is a gateway drug, it's just a stunt of the greens. Cannabis can only be legalized for medical purposes. Um, and sometimes it does boggle the mind that how easy it is for them to completely ignore the real world, ignore history, and somehow keep saying that no, we want to stamp out drugs, that no one in this world or no one in Australia at least should use drugs. We know that people always have and always will use drugs. What their prohibitionist policies do is actually hurt people. They're not helping people one single bit. Last year, there were more than 26,000 criminal incidents of cannabis possession in New South Wales. And these made up more than half of all drug possession offenses and more than all other drugs combined. So these failed attempts to wipe out cannabis use continue to drag people through the criminal justice system causing unnecessary damage to them, to their families, as well as wasting immense police resources. And we know who these laws target as well. They target the vulnerable, Aboriginal people, homeless people, and people who suffer from mental health issues. Moreover, I think the government's glacial pace of legalizing med medicinal cannabis has meant that these arrests include those who are forced to access cannabis on the so-called black market for treatment. In Australia, unfortunately, the long arm of the law still has a very long reach and continues to wage a war on drugs, which is really effectively a war on people. The simple reality is that more than one in three of us has consumed cannabis in their life, and one in 10 has done it just in the previous year. Surely no one can agree that these millions of people are criminals. And the public is more and more agreeing with us. The Australian National University 30-year election study published last year found less than a third of people support the current system, um, sorry, do not support the current system of criminalization. Um, evidence is mounting for an alternative system of managing and minimizing harm. We just saw a really successful trial in Canberra at the Groove in the Moo Festival uh, where pill testing was done and two of the pills that were detected were potentially deadly. So we at least saved two, two lives. And there were many more people who came face to face with you know, health professionals and had a chat about drugs and you know, what harms or not they could cause. A medical injecting center is being established in Melbourne the same drivers for legalizing um, cannabis that were in the United States are very much present in Australia. And principally, it's to end the ineffective and punitive approaches that damage health and damage society. And you all know, of course, the secondary economic benefits of a regulated system of cannabis use as well. My discussions with cannabis advocates in the US say that this is one of the powerful arguments in changing the views of politicians and trying, them, trying for them to support the legalization of cannabis because licensing revenues can generate significant income which can be reinvested in education or health programs or whatever else public service we want to invest them in. 
For example, in 2017 in Colorado, which has about 2 million people less than New South Wales, so not that far off, the legal cannabis market was worth $1.5 billion and generated half a billion dollars in tax re revenue and fees since it was legalized. And that's been put towards schools and public health. The legal cannabis industry is expected to employ 300,000 people by 2020 in the US states where it's been legalized. And this is certainly better and much more positive than the billions wasted on prohibition, which as I said earlier, is pretty damaging to us. The Australian Federal Police and the Australian Border Force alone are projected to spend almost $300 million on policing cannabis in the next couple of years. And add to that the huge amount that's spent in each state on policing, on drug dogs, on raids. Just driving here, I think, um, when you turn off to Nimbin, I think I saw seven police cars just in the you know, 20 minutes or so it took me to come here. Um, the Greens also commissioned modeling from the Parliamentary Budget Office, which indicated that the government would raise $3.6 billion over four years from July 2019 if can cannabis was um, legalized, regulated, and taxed in Australia. We also need to say clearly that just decriminalization and ca or caution schemes simply aren't good enough for cannabis, because that's a question we are often asked, you know, why not, if you're thinking about health and the criminal justice system, why not just decriminalize it? In many Australian states, there is a cannabis caution scheme that has operated for many years. And in New South Wales, based on recommendations from the New South Wales Drug Summit that happened in 1999, Police have had the discretion to caution rather than charge adults detected for minor cannabis offenses. But how you are dealt with under the scheme and by the law actually depends on where you are. A 2011 New South Wales Auditor General's report found pretty concerning geographic disparities as to whether someone found with a small amount of cannabis was cautioned or whether they were charged. So police in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, the North Shore and the Hills District issues a caution more than 70% of the times. This plunges to less than 20% at Quakers Hill, Walgett and Bathurst. So the law must be clear and equal for all and that clearly isn't the case. And for your information in the Richmond local area command which covers Nimbin, um, the rate has been 50-50, so 50% cautions and 50% charges. A couple of years ago, I actually had the opportunity to visit California and Oregon and met with many cannabis legalization advocates, including the Drug Policy Alliance. And my question, one of the questions I most frequently asked them was, how on earth they managed to not only win the battle for hearts and minds, but to bring politicians along with them? Because it has been a movement there in the US that has brought together parents, religious leaders, police, and drug law reform activists and advocates. I do note, however, that there are differences in the political system, of course, where in the United States they've had initiated referendums and you know, ballot initiatives, which are a strong part of participatory democracy that we don't have here in New South Wales or Australia. Um, I did meet with a lot of experts as well, visited dispensaries um, that provide cannabis for recreational and medicinal purposes, and I toured growing facilities and labs where it's tested. Um, and I saw the passion and the compassion of people involved in the industry, and it really opened my eyes to how different the debate on drugs is outside of Australia. One thing I did learn, and I do want to talk about it a little bit, is that we need to broaden our movement. Um, even and especially, I think, with people who we may not have a lot in common with on other matters, perhaps. So legalizing cannabis is not an issue dominated by the left or the right. In the United States, the majority of people in Alaska voted for legalization, but they haven't voted for a Democratic president, for instance, since 1964. The neoliberal Adam Smith Institute has called the current drug strategy a failure and is strongly advocating for legalization as the only solution to crime and addiction problems. So I think we have to and we must form a coalition of unlikely allies who will join the movement for a whole range of reasons. 
and we have the evidence from the United States to help us. One example we have in New South Wales Parliament at the moment is a New South Wales Parliamentary Cross-Party Harm Minimization Roundtable, which I sit on as well, and there's Liberal, Labour Party MPs, as well as Independents. But I think more broadly, we need other allies, um, and the question is how to convince them to come on board. So for instance, for police officers and law enforcement, the trigger might be the huge amount of wasted resources and time while seeing people dragged through the criminal justice system for a victimless crime. And I did meet quite a few ex-police officers rather in the United States um, who had left the police force because of this very issue. Uh, because they'd seen people using cannabis being dragged through the system and for them it was completely illogical and they have now become involved in either fighting the fight for legalizing cannabis or actually involved in the industry as well. And of course Mick Palmer here in Australia, the former AFP commissioner has said that these kinds of laws inevitably target the vulnerable and he's become a strong ally in this movement. For public health advocates, for example, it could be the decrease in drink driving and overuse of opioids. Um, and new evidence that has recently emerged from the USA has seen that fully legalizing cannabis, both recreational and medicinal, has seen prescriptions for opioids um, actually go down. Here in Australia, during 2011 and 2015, 3,601 people died from an opi opioid-related overdose. And that's nearly twofold increase from 2001 to 2005. There is, of course, the libertarian argument that adults should be able to make choices to consume drugs as long as no one else is hurt. Because it makes no sense that we, as a society, are okay with alcohol being available literally on tap, but would seek to criminalize cannabis or not legalize it, which has far less social and health problems. And for others, it may be the very significant amount of revenue that can be generated to put into other public good. For most Australians, and of course all of you sitting here, it makes complete sense and logic to take drug use out of the shadows. Um, and, you know, and wherever it's needed to help drug users as well as their family and the wider community. Certainly all of us being more matter of fact in the way we actually talk about drugs will help in removing the shame and the stigma that is still associated um, with drugs. I just want to end with a quote that I really like, which I understand is misattributed to Gandhi, but is still very useful. And it states, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So friends, I do believe that we are moving closer and closer to this win. In fact, in leaps and bounds, but our work is not done yet. We have to keep having open conversations with everyone who will listen to us, and as many people as possible. So let's keep the momentum up until we actually free the weed. Thank you so much for having me. And I do want to quickly acknowledge my colleague, Daniel Reed, who's here and who's the Greens candidate for Page as well. Questions or even comments on how to move forward and quickly? <laughs> My partner, actually, who promotes Greens at every opportunity he usually gets, has a problem with this and he has said to me that he feels it's going to divide the Greens. It's going to drop their vote, not divide the Greens, but drop their vote in the next election. So how would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I must say I'm sorry to hear that, but this policy for us has been um, a long time in the making. So it, it wasn't just, you know, a thought bubble or a whim. We have discussed this in the party literally for decades as well. And as we've seen evidence emerge um, from other places who have done this, I think that's what's really turned the tables for the Greens. Um, you know, Richard Dinerali is a medical doctor himself and he's worked in drugs and alcohol. Um, and so it hasn't been an easy conversation necessarily in the Greens as well, but we have seen that in, in, in the current situation, people are still taking cannabis. But what's happening is that you know, if they do need help 
they're not getting the treatment. You know, if there are mental health issues, that's not happening because it's all under the shadows. And it's the drug dealers that are making a huge amount of money. So I think evidence from overseas does say that this is the only way to improve social um, benefits and health for the community. And that's, for us, is the key aspect of this particular policy. Yes, I'm very happy to have a conversation with him as well. Ask him to give me a call or her. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's a very rational approach, really. Any other questions? Here we go. Oh, okay. I've got, I've got a question about the six plants that you were saying mm -hmm. you're pushing. What size were they? What size restrictions were they? So I think that's something that the um, Australian Cannabis Agency, that has the functions of actually establishing those sorts of things, looking at the expert evidence. Also, they will establish the THC and CBD content as well of the cannabis that comes to market. So they will have, uh, in our model and our framework, the Australian Cannabis Agency uh, will have a, a body of experts actually advising them on these sorts of things. I'd like to know the um, importance of the particular um, premier who's in power at any given moment, like for example, Mike Baird, I think it was quite least strongly in support of cannabis um, decriminalization. And I wonder if Gladys is, or if she's kind of set you back. And mm. so that's one. And also the second one is like state by state, where is New South Wales, like compared mm. to other states? Mm. So I'm not sure if Mike Baird was uh, in favor of decriminalization. I think he was in favor of medicinal cannabis. Um, sadly, as I said, both the old, big old parties, you know, every time we stand up and say, you know, there should be a pill testing trial in New South Wales, for instance, or this should be um, cannabis should be legalized and regulated, immediately come out and say, no, you know, we want people to stop using cannabis. So, unfortunately, it's not a good situation anywhere in Australia, but New South Wales especially is very shackled with century-old thinking, you know. Giving you one example, New South Wales is one of the only two states in Australia which still have um, abortion as a criminal offence. So, you know, we, um, yeah, we, we're not looking very good, but the only way that we will change is if we hold politicians to account. Uh, you know, if we really ask this question again and again, and we have both the federal and the state elections coming up in the next 12 months. Um, and we really have to put them on the spot, all the candidates and all the MPs, and ask them their position on this. And if you don't like their position, don't vote for them. I think it's really important. It is really important. So we, we do have a long way to go, but I think on the, the positive thing is that the community conversation has completely changed. Even five years ago, I can see that change even in five years. Um, it's very positive. Most people I talk to, completely understand the logic of it. And I think that's a sign. When that community conversation changed, like I said, that zeitgeist, once that has changed, it's inevitable. The politicians will have to follow. But we have to keep at it. I was wondering, where do you get... I was wondering, where do you get your pool of experts? I, I always hear that turned out, and then I end up at these meetings, I mm -hmm. have questions about, what is a qualification for an expert on cannabis? So there are, there's a number of specialist research institutes which are looking into drugs, alcohol, um, you know, and other things. One of them is at the University of New South Wales. So there's a lot of researchers there who are looking into it, and I often call um, into them um, to ask them what their research suggests and, um, you know, what their expertise says. There are then individual doctors like um, David Caldecott and Alex Wodak who have you know, for a very long time looking again into drugs and alcohol. So that's what the experts are. There are people who actually are at drug rehabilitation clinics, for instance. Um, I'm actually sitting on an inquiry at the moment which is looking at drug rehabilitation services in rural and remote New South Wales. And we've come across people who work in those facilities who have a lot of good experience and information on what they see on the front line. So there's a variety of different experts around. Uh, next question. Oh, sorry. Next question, yes. Maureen, this is going to be a hard one to answer. And it, I don't know. I haven't read anything on it. 
so hopefully you have. What's a safe age to introduce cannabis into a child's life? What's a safe age? So we are saying it's for adult use, so 18 plus. 18 plus. Okay, 18 yeah. plus. 18 Thank plus, you. yeah. Okay, I think we might wrap it up. Thank you so, so Thank much, you very much for coming Thank to share. <laughs> We've had a great